Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Sarah Newman. I'm the Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Corcoran. And it is a true pleasure to welcome you here tonight um, uh, into a conversation between Shawanda Roundtree and Iona Rosiel Brown speaking about um, art and community here in Washington. And it's presented in um, conjunction with the Washington Project for the Arts. The evening was uh, originally meant to include the artist Shanique Smith as well, um, but unfortunately she couldn't make it tonight. The evening's event is part of a really strong slate of programs designed in conjunction with our current exhibition, 30 Americans, which showcases some of the best work by African American artists from the last three decades. Generous support has been provided by American Express for the artist lectures in this series. Um, for more information about the full series and to see what we have coming up, please um, consult our website. The program tonight is one that I'm personally really excited about and have been looking forward to for a long time, in part because it represents a homecoming of sorts. Both Shwanda and Iona are intimately tied to DC in different ways and are completely invested in the art scene here. Their discussion tonight is going to involve a conversation between the two of them about Iona's work, but also about the city's art community and the ways that DC provides a context for art and culture more generally. Shwanda Roundtree is a practicing attorney, a collector, an independent art dealer, and a consultant. Since moving to Washington in 2000, she's become a true force here in DC. She's a champion of emerging artists and also of institutions. And at the Corcoran, she's been involved in, um, she's a member of our advisory committee for 30 Americans, and she's an active member of our steering committee for our Corcoran Contemporaries group. She's gonna be talking tonight with Iona Rosiel Brown, who it is a huge thrill to welcome. Iona is originally from Washington, and she received her MFA from Yale in 2002. She's a painter, a printmaker, a designer, a choreographer, and a DJ. And this multifaceted practice is important because her work is so much about this mashup of different styles and ideas that lead to completely strange and fantastic results. She's referred to her work as an Afro-Asiatic allegory because it explores the hybridized identities that are created when cultures come together. Most specifically, the Japanese phenomenon of ganguro, in which Japanese young people appropriate the signifiers of hip hop. The work Iona makes is about this mashup um, and it becomes similarly hybridized. She takes the forms of Japanese ukiyo-e prints and um, uses it to explore the commodification of contemporary African-American culture. And the products that result are these weird, hybridized, beautiful creatures that are kind of combinations of hip hop divas and geishas. Iona's work is a part of the 30 Americans exhibition upstairs, and I hope you get a chance to view it tonight. If not tonight, then um, sometime soon. And she has a, new, a show of new work opening at G Fine Art across town this Saturday, which will be well ch worth checking out as well. Shwanda and Iona will be in conversation and um, for, um, for a, a good amount of time, and then we'll have time to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and the way we'll do that is um, there'll be a microphone that will pass around to you if you want to ask a question. So please let us know if you have a question and we'll bring the microphone to you. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome Shawanda and Iona up to the stage. I've been waiting for this for a while. <laughs> I know that many people in the audience are familiar with your cross-cultural concept um, in terms of the interesting elements of hip-hop, Japanese culture, sci-fi, African folklore, and fashion. But I want you to explain <clears throat> the references in your work today um, in terms of the Islamic calligraphy and your references to underground culture of 80s um, New York, if you don't mind. If I say I'm mind, does that mean I don't have to answer? <laughs> and I'm just going to flip through um, the AQ series, sure. Black Face series, mm -hmm. um, just so. Well, with the you know with the the New York culture, I think that um, it's obviously more. My work is more inundated with that now because mm -hmm. I'm there. 
But growing up in DC, I think New York was always a place that I just looked to. I mean, my first two records that I bought, one of them was Soul Sonic Force by African Bambada. The other one was Tilt by Arcade Funk, which is go-go. So it's like go-go mm -hmm. and hip-hop. So for me, and I think I was 13-ish, 11, 13-ish, which is around the same time that I went to see Kabuki. So I couldn't help it. It just all hit me at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can help it. When, when, when inspiration hits you, it just mm -hmm. hits you. Right? So New York has always been something that I aspired to, um, maybe not even recognizing that I wanted to actually live there. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in terms of like a visual stimuli, always very important. My mother and I would go to New York um, to see plays. So I saw The Wiz. I know I'm showing my age when I say that. <laughs> But I saw The Wiz, I saw Your Arms Too Short, The Bop Is God, which I don't even oh, think they wow. write. Okay. <laughs> that, I mean, we saw Pippin. I mean, I saw a lot of stuff. I think I saw Jesus Christ Superstar there, too. I mean, we would go mm -hmm. to New York all the time. And when I got a little bit older, like in high school, she would take me shopping. We'd go down to Fashion Ave. I mean, that was really a special time. And my mother was actually the one that took me to see the Kabuki when it came, when I was like 11. And I actually saw Bunraku when I was seven. So all of these inspirations that I have, I didn't have a, ch I didn't have a choice, it just happened. Mm -hmm. But I think the choice becomes what you do with it. Like once it comes to you, like what do you actually do with it? Like, do you ignore it? Do you accept it? I accepted it and I ignored it at the same time. And it didn't come up until I read this article about these young Japanese children that were darkening their skin. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? Why? And then I, I read further and you know, they were interested, they were, they were enamored with hip hop. So number one, I said, oh, hip hop made it to Japan? This is in 97. I was like, hip hop made it to Japan? That's amazing. Wait, they're darkened in their skin? That sucks, that's terrible. Why are they doing that? Don't they know how hard it is to be dark <laughs> on this planet? Like I didn't understand, I really didn't get that. And then I thought further, I was like, wait a minute, that's like actually insulting. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, and I <clears throat> I applaud DJ Crush, who's a Japanese DJ. He was interviewed and, and, and asked back in like the late 90s, or maybe mid 90s, because this phenomenon actually had a very short lifespan. It was like mid 90s to, to, to late 90s. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, they asked him, he said, well, what do you think about these kids that, that dark, these black facers, because that's what I should call them. And he said, well, they're just ignorant. They don't know. But I've been to Japan, and I under and fortunately, I understand why they did it. I don't appreciate it, and I don't, endorse it, but I understand it. Well, back when your mom took you to, to New York and you were mm -hmm. exposed to Kabuki, did you envision yourself being in Japan as a little girl, or did it <laughs> even get to that level? No, I, you know, my, <laughs> I'm laughing because the conversation I'm about to share with you. My mother um, was a math teacher here in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and it kind of, on, on some level doesn't make sense that she was interested in everything that she was interested in. Mm -hmm. But I know her, so it makes sense to me. But as a mathematician, you're just kind of like, well, why would she be interested in the Kabuki? My mother was interested in anything interesting, right? So we went to the Kabuki, I was about 11, attitude wow. down. And my mother said, you know, there's only men in Kabuki, there's no women. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> I didn't think it was relevant. And out walks Bando Tamasabro, who is an onagata. And in Kabuki plays, the onagata is, well that translates, ona means woman, and gata is style. Mm. So there's a ceremony that these actors go through where they, they leave the realm of manhood to onagatahood. And so he gets to dress, that's like your license to dress and act as a feminine being. It's not femininity, it's a form of a feminine being, right? Mm -hmm. And here, here he comes walking out. And only at 11, I'm like, that's a woman. There's no, I've never seen, I wanna move like that. And I said to my mother, I thought you said, I no, Russ, I thought you said there were no women. She said, that's a man, shh. And I'm like. <laughs> so I'm looking through, and I'll tell you, if you look him up, Bando, B-A-N, D.O. Tamasaburo, he's amazing. You look him up online, and you can look up YouTube, and you'll see him. He's phenomenal, phenomenal. And I'm still not 
I, I've never been over him. Mm. And when I saw him walk out and my mother was like, no, that's a man. I was like, I don't even understand how that's, what do you mean that's a man? I'd never seen anything like that in my life. The only distinguishing characteristic, because Kabuki is all white makeup. Right. Right? So there's really no way to tell. Well, then what even tricks it out more is when you look at the program, all the actors are not in makeup. So that's what I had to contend with. I was like, I need to know who this guy is. I'm like this with the program. <laughs> he had the thickest lips I had ever seen. Mm. I wonder if there's a competition between the women and the men. Well, let me that. tell you, in ancient Edo, we're talking the 17th century, Kabuki actually started out, I don't know how many of you know this, started out being performed by women. And the samurai used to fight over the women. So then the shogun says, no more women in Kabuki which I don't think that was the issue. I think you should have banned the samurai. <laughs> but they have two swords, so you kind of have to let them do what they do. Mm -hmm. So then she, he bans the women, and instead of women, they have young boys do the kabuki. Well, the samurai were fighting over them too. Mm. So then he said, okay, no women and no young boys. And what ended up happening was, if you look at prints of, of early onagata, they'll have a purple sash over their forehead. Well, that's because every man had to have that top knot. Well, you can't play a woman if you're bald right here. Mm -hmm. So they would put like a piece of purple material there to cover that up, right? So the whole thing with, with, with Banda Tamasabara was that he had these really, really thick lips. And I'm looking at the program and I found one actor that had his lips. And I literally was like this, I'm 11. <laughs> I'm like that. <laughs> and I locked into that guy and I never forgot about him. I didn't do any, I didn't know anything about why I was so drawn to him. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand about Kabuki. I, I mean, I saw it twice. I didn't get it, I just knew I loved it. But it wasn't until I saw these kids, and she actually, this is actually a portrait of an actual woman that I met in Japan. In 2005? Who, in 2005, who actually was dark. Mm -hmm. And just a little side note to let you know how much of what we do goes there. I said to her, do you mind if I take your picture? I'm not kidding you. She was like. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I said, it all gets here, huh? <laughs> then I go back a little bit later. I'm like, I'm, this is ser I'm not even making this up. Uh -huh. I saw these two guys. They were sagging. And the, the hats were cocked, right? Like really cocked. And they had all kinds of bling, right? I saw them walk by and they were, I, saw, I thought, man, they studied a lot. That's amazing. I'm not kidding you. 10 minutes later, I'm walking down the street, the cops have pulled them over. And I thought, yeah, you get all of it. <laughs> all of it, you getting it. Wow. <laughs> Do you think it, <laughs> Do you think it just comes from the music, or have they studied other things? They're not interested because in De La Soul. They're not interested in Denzel. More of the radio music. Type. They're interested in Lil Wayne mm -hmm. and Young Jeezy and Jigga and anybody who is emulating a stereotype, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that Jay Z is a stereotype, but I'm just he is who he is. But that's what's marketed. Pimp cut. Mm. You can see the word pimp right there, right? Yeah, yeah. And this was actually, <laughs> this was actually after, uh, what's his name? 50 Cent mm. came out with some song where he said he was an Eming effing P-I-M-P. Mm -hmm. So I used to look at a lot of katakana, which is the Japanese text that they use to describe more of our terminology. Because yeah. it's more phonetic, right? So I started to look at images that of the characters that actually looked like they could be our lettering, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I started, so you can see it's, there's supposed to be an M, and then it's U-T-H-A, then an F-U, and you know, and then P-I-M-P. -P. Can you all see that in there? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, because yeah. I was gonna ask you about that. When I go through and look at your paintings, it looks like you create your own language, so to speak. Yeah. And I'm not sure if, you're tr if you want the viewer to understand the language, or if it's sort of like a coding text, so to speak? It's, you know, um, it's funny. I'm funny like that. Mm -hmm. Because I want you to get it, but I don't want to give it all to you. Yeah. Just I want you to work for it a little bit, right? <laughs> you know? I love this. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I mean, they do. All, this is like I'm not even playing. Like it's the thing is really funny to me is that um, it really is about observation. I mean, it's like children. Like children respond to their parents, and they, or even where they're in, when they're in school or whoever, whomever they're around, mm -hmm. and they emulate. Um, the reason that the men are so scowled up in these images is because that's what, what, I actually saw that in Japan, but I actually saw it before I left Japan, I saw it here. Yeah. So, you know, you, wanna, you, wanna give, you want to give me the impression that you're from a particular situation. So you chain, you know, you sag this and you do this and you're all here with it, but you're from the burbs. <laughs> Your parents both work, are together. You got a big house, but you come out like raw. I'm like, <laughs> so I can't really get mad at the Japanese kids because it happens here at home. Like that's why I think I felt so comfortable and took the liberty to, to depict the Japanese children or youth like that because I had already seen it firsthand. I grew up with that. Right. I I knew a young woman, a white girl, who used to go to the bar, to used to go to the the beauty parlor to get her head wrapped. I'm like, but your hair is straight though. Why do you have to go through? All that? <laughs> but she did it because she wanted to be. She wanted to connect with her with her black female friends, mm -hmm. and she was, you know, not Mary Murray. Like I'm like, I I don't know. <laughs> Let me ask you this though, the Japanese <laughs> men, the Japanese male, how was the posturing? Like how did they interact oh. with the young females there in Japan? I don't know how they acted with the young females, but I do have my own personal story about the Japanese males. Okay. I went to a club to go see Pete Rock. Mm -hmm. And you know, Pete Rock is, he's a DJ, he's peaceful. That's not the kind of energy that he, you know, he's not a shoot him up kind of guy. He comes in, he's an amazing mixologist a brilliant producer. He's very well respected, not only here, but in Japan. Right. So we actually, I was, I was living in Osaka, and a lot of my friends at that time were, were DJs. Mm -hmm. um, so we go to, we drove to Kyoto, which was probably about like 30 minutes away. So I'm excited. I've never seen Pete Rock. I've grown up listening to his music, so I'm excited. So I walk into this club, and all the Japanese men, I mean, literally, the hats are here. And they're looking at me like, I said, oh, we didn't walked up into a Yakuza spot. <laughs> I literally thought they were gang, like serious like Yakuza gangsters. I was really, really intimidated. Really? The first time in Japan, I felt scared. So I go to the dance floor, and everybody's dancing, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful time. Mm -hmm. And this young Japanese boy bumped into me. But when I say he bumped into me, it's like, he bumped into like half my body, uh -huh. like it was a personal thing. And I, I didn't really understand it because that hadn't happened to me. And so my first reaction was, I was like, dude. That's all I could get out was dude. Mm -hmm. And immediately, oh, go in sight. He like bowed and apologized. <laughs> and I looked at him and I'm like, you're a fake thug. <laughs> Wow. You're not real, but I mean, it's emulation. Like you don't really yeah, know yeah. until you're up on it who's, who's legitimate anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because everybody's in character and that's where that kabuki comes in and the onagata because the onagata is a man who's playing, he's actually not even a man, he actually is an onagata. Like that's an actual thing. It's a different gender. It's a gender mashup. Mm. So he gets to play the women roles. So he's no longer a man. He's an onagata that plays female roles, but it's all about posturing. Mm -hmm. It's all about how he carries himself, right? You can see that with like RuPaul. RuPaul in drag is different from RuPaul straight. And that was another thing. Like as I got older and I started to go into tracks, for example, I'd go on Wednesday nights and I actually saw a voguing for the first time. I'm like, what is that? That's amazing. And I'm watching all these men like in dresses and looking more like a woman that I could ever dream to, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's all, it's all about posturing and it's all about acting, I think. It's theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very intrigued by this whole Afrofuturism <laughs> concept, so you have okay. to let me in on that. Um, I've read that you've studied a lot of Octavia Butler's Oh books. man, I was just about to bring her up when okay. I was talking about the... Okay, so Ugh. tell me a little bit about that. Man, Octavia Butler... She's amazing. 
She's <laughs> absolutely she's absolutely amazing. She um, was one of the I don't know if she was the only, but I know she was one of the most revered black and then female science fiction writers. Mm. And what's what I find interesting is how um, fluid her stories are in the sense that when I was reading them, I was very aware of my sense of self as a black woman, mm -hmm. but I was also very aware of, of the futuristic realm. And you don't really see us incorporated into the future. Like Richard Pryor has this great joke about seeing Logan's run and there being no black people in there. And then his next line is, you know, white folks ain't planning for us to be here. But I mean, come on. <laughs> Lando Calrissian, and then he dimes out everybody. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that in the future. I want to be in the future in sci-fi respectable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the one that died. And I, don't even get me started on Jar Jar, because I got letters for George Lucas on that one. Jar Jar, like really? But Artavia is 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 she's a reprieve from all of that, because mm -hmm. she incorporates all these wonderful historic moments in our in our history which is everybody's history, but they're more respectable and they're more, for me, realistic. So in Wild Seed, there's this amazing scene where her character, who's a shapeshifter, and she's been around for like ever, she's on a slave ship mm -hmm. with the man that she's interested in. She sees dolphins for the first time. She's like, what's that? And he says, these are dolphins. And they catch one. She takes a little sliver of it, tastes it, and now she can replicate the DNA. I'm like, now that. Wow is amazing. Wow. It's a shapeshifter. Mm. And you know, that actually comes very close to a lot of Native American culture. And I grew up with my father always telling me that my great grandfather was Cherokee and how they escaped the reservation. So that was something else that I kind of felt that I had the liberty to pull in because of how I was raised mm -hmm. and what I was told. Mm -hmm. But Octavia Butler was amazing. And it's so sad that she was taken so early. She had only finished her first book, The Fledging, which was about uh, vampires and I just I could see where she was going with it and it just it really inspired me like all these different these different characters the power that they had mm -hmm. how they looked like she was very precise in how she described them you could just see how they looked mm -hmm. and I mean I read I read all of her books like one summer I just kind of went through everything and mm -hmm. it, it stayed with me okay. you know yeah. We'll get into your mythology a little bit later, but yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your exhibition at the um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland, Cleveland. Sure. Mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. And what really struck me about this was your close um, interaction with the youth there mm -hmm. and the impact that you had um, with them. Mm -hmm. And this is um, an installation that was mm -hmm. created. Um, yeah, that was fun. Um, with how many students or how many? Um... We had eight. Okay. Yeah, we had eight. They were great. They were so great. <laughs> and uh, I see the main character here. Yoshi. Yes, Yoshi, <laughs> which is the cool character who's always like on a on a bike. She's got a terrible attitude. <laughs> She's awful. She's awful. And I think it's just amazing that you created this um, <laughs> this layered mythology, so to speak. Mm -hmm. with all of these different characters. And I've tried to read as much about it as possible. It seems very um, complex and deep um, how you've sort of gotten into it, but it's an epic mythology. And um, so now I know that it came from, the, sort of was inspired from the sci-fi a little bit. It, yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> definitely uh, Octavia Butler, definitely Ben Oakley. Okay. Hamish Road. Definitely yes. Amos Tutola. Um, uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts and Palm Wine Drunkard. Definitely. Um, and Tolkien. Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell you, I didn't grow up reading Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Shame on me. But when I was in Japan and starving for English mm -hmm. for three months, I watched every extended version and the appendices. <laughs> every day. And I thought Tolkien, I was like, this guy was amazing. He created his own language. He created a myth. He said, you know what? I'm lacking. I don't see me here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put myself in. And Alice Walker talks about that, about what, writing 
you into that, mm -hmm. into that world, into the space, so that you are represented. And I felt akin to that somehow. I just, I really resonated with, with all of those mm -hmm. at one time. But Tolkien was, was, was when I really started to think about creating these characters. Because I was, you know, I was in Japan, I was there to study the theater. I got a fellowship for, for six months. Mm -hmm. I went to Kabuki and no, that's all I did was go to the theater and buy records. Check out DJs, go to the theater. Go to the theater, check out the DJs. Sounds nice to me. It was wonderful. <laughs> it was absolutely divine. Sounds nice. Yeah. So, That's what probably did why she's got 45 adapters on her pants. Mm. I can't help it. <laughs> she's tough. Yeah. What type of conversation did you have with the youth while you were creating? Because I, I went oh, online and I saw a bunch of images where you actually, I don't know how many days it took, but. Right. Well, it actually took a whole year. Like we, we actually went to the schools. There were three schools. Mm -hmm. I think one of them was um, like an arts school. Like they had music and arts. And then one of them was a <coughs> charter school and then one of them was a public school. Mm -hmm. So we went to the schools a year before told them of the idea, because Cleveland, um, Megan Reich, who I worked very closely with, wrote a proposal to the Joyce Foundation. Right. And we got that grant. And part of the stipulation when you get that grant is you have to do community outreach. So we already knew going in that we had to have um, some community outreach, and we excuse me, came up with the idea of incorporating Yoshi, because if you look at her original painting, or the original piece I did, her cape is all full of um, slang flashcards, which I could, yes, mm -hmm. which I took offense <laughs> to. I'm like, how, we, what I took offense to was the fact that the company copyrighted the slang. Right? Oh, really? I'm like, how do you copyright gully, a gangster, sick with it? Like, you don't get to own that, mm -hmm. that's not yours. So I did that sort of in the same vein of communicating with each other, how blacks communicated with each other through quilts right. about the Underground Railroad, right. which I know has been disputed, but I thought, of course, you would be able to communicate visually a sign, something, I mean, gang signs, some, kind of, some kind of anything, some kind of Visual. shape. And so that's how she started. Um, and she's one of the warrior Yeah, characters. she's one of the bodhisattvas. Like, uh -huh. so she's, we actually call them char, star children. Okay. So they're just below the in, the, in the whole hierarchy, in the whole realm, they're just below the last tier of deities. So she gets her orders from a group of women called the Council of Voices. Right. Yeah. So the deities, let's go back, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a little, it's a bit layered. I'm <laughs> and I'm trying to catch up. So the deities, what I've learned is that Kachi the is the incubator yeah. who actually... She's not the top either. She's, she's like, not, she's like, she's, yeah. This is Kachi, right? Yeah, that's Kachi the incubator. Okay. But and she's inside not, are the saplings. Are the saplings, right. Okay. So everybody starts out, and this I got from Ben Oakley, because Ben Oakley in mm. Famished Road talks about how we're all in heaven as spirit children. And that whole story is about the spirit children making a pact. We know we're going to earth and earth is horrible. So the moment we get there, the moment we get a chance, we're killing ourselves so we can get back. And he uses that as a reason for, like, for example, infant mortality rate, mm -hmm. so crib deaths. Mm -hmm. Like the children are actually aware of the fact that they're at Earth, they're on Earth, and they won't be here anymore. So I took that whole concept of being a spiritual being somewhere else and, and having your spiritual brothers and sisters around you. And I, I actually joke with really good friends of mine. I'm like, we're probably in line right next to each other in heaven. Like the closer I get you, like the more in connection we are. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you were probably like right near me. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, the further away you get, the less you understand. But the people who are like, the spirits that are like right near you, the ones that you actually connect with, they're your soulmates. Mm -hmm. So that was the whole premise of, of, of my story, which I took from Ben Oakley's whole idea about being a spirit child. And, Mm -hmm. So I had this idea that we're all in line, waiting to get assigned, which he talks about right. being assigned parents. And the one child that decides not to leave, decides his parents need him more, and that's more important than his pact mm -hmm. with his spirit 
brothers and sisters, and they come for him. They come to get him. So he sees all these very strange, like there's a, there's a guy in the back of a bar, he's got an arm coming out of his head, because he doesn't know how to dress like a human. Mm -hmm. So the regular person would just see that as some strange dude in the back, but because this boy has sight, he sees that this guy has put on the body wrong. He's put it on incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And he knows that he's there for him. So it's this whole battle between, it's very samurai in, in, in essence as yeah, well, because yeah. the samurai are always conflicted between what to do, like the right thing to do, and then the samurai thing to do. Because mm -hmm. as a samurai, you have to be committed to your lord. It kind of doesn't matter that the right thing to do is to save the drowning boy. Right. If the drowning boy has information that can, can incriminate your lord, you gotta let him go. Mm -hmm. But and that's then, a conflict, right? Right. So that, but you know, to get back, I don't want to go too far off of that. But that's that's these are essentially. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, this whole image here is so, so deep because even when you look at her um, her posture and the pose, is isn't that like a yoga? Yoga posture, so to speak. I... It's been argued that it is, and that she's Somebody supposed to be a that? calm, nice, calm. Um, <laughs> well, the posture. only thing I can tell you about Kachi is she doesn't have a belly button. Why? Because she just showed up. Ah. Very much, and I'll tell you why that is. Because when I was younger, I had an affinity for Athena, uh -huh. and I thought Athena's story was amazing because Zeus birthed her from his head, and I always kind of thought that my dad birthed me from his head. That I wasn't actually, that didn't come through my mom, that my dad like thought me into existence. Which I thought Athena was just so special because she was the only one of those deities that wasn't born, mm -hmm. she was thought of. He brought her to being. Right. And, and, and that right there makes her so much more powerful to me than in any other deities. Mm -hmm. And she was the goddess of war. So most of my, my deities have this very strong characteristic and so what I did with Kachi was I gave her tattoos and I also said, you know what, she wasn't born, there's no belly button for yeah, her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we laugh and we, you know, but a lot of these images deal with a lot of serious issues, particularly when it deals with um, women or young girls, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, if, what, I guess what has been the reaction from from young girls, if they get it, or if you've had a chance to, to mentor and actually try to connect the work to the message, so to speak. Right. Because if you look at like anime, for example, and mm -hmm. I don't know if I have an image of her, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, the character anime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who's one of the trouble saplings, yeah. saplings. Yeah. and um, I'm just wondering if you've had an opportunity to be able to connect with the youth with through the young children. Yeah. Well, you know, ironically enough, that's my goddaughter. Oh, wow. I, yeah, she posed. I actually caught her. She was doing poses for me for something else. Mm -hmm. And um, I had her in headphones, and, and I, we were at my studio, and I said, wait, hold on a second. I'm having a problem with the camera. <clears throat> and I looked over, and she was just sitting cross-legged. And I thought, she's so sweet. And she. Had, She'd gone through a lot, and it mm -hmm. resonated with me because, um, yeah, everybody just has their little their little things that they go through as kids. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of coming to grips with a lot of the stuff, right. so I was really sensitive to it. And I felt very much like all I want to do is, if I had wings, <laughs> is spread them and just protect her. Mm -hmm. And I feel sp I feel particularly that way about girls, even more so with black girls. Mm -hmm. It's just not a fair setup. It right. just isn't. Right. It's not. You know, and I, was, I remember watching a video by an artist that I actually, I, I appreciate him as an artist. His name is The Dream. And he has a lot of Prince-esque things that he does. Mm -hmm. he's a, he, you know, he's a musician. He's fantastic, right? And then I was watching one of his videos, and I realized, I said, all the girls in this video look like they're teenagers. And the stuff he was singing, I, yeah, well, don't shake your head, because most people like R. Kelly. Oh, yeah, I know. I never, just for the record, I never liked R. Kelly. Are you sure? Never. You sure? Hand, hand up. Never, 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 never. And I didn't appreciate the fact that he got to marry Aaliyah at 16. So I'm still bitter about that. Oh, but people want to work with that dude. Mm -hmm. He's urinated on who knows whom, and people still want to work with him. I have a problem with that. I have a serious problem with that. Mm -hmm. Because you're rewarding this man for disrespecting children. 
-hmm. Which means that once this child gets to be a woman, unless she figures it out, men are going to be disrespecting her still. Right. Because one of your characters um, became a pros prostitute. Okay. That's what the whole performance is about. Right. It's about leaving the arms of one monster to another mm -hmm. one. She didn't know any better. But didn't she get her revenge, like, at some point? I didn't write that. No. <laughs> Story. Maybe I'm reading too much stuff. But that's nice. Maybe she breaks out with some <laughs> no, lays waste to everybody. You know, here's an interesting, like not to take it too far, but if there's a roots, there's a song that the roots do, uh -huh. which I can't remember the name of it, but it's very empowering for these women. You know, mm -hmm. we can talk about that later. Well, let's talk. Let's tie in some of the musical references. Yes. This is like one of my favorite images. I love the title. Watch out for the big girls. I love that song. Um, I'm a big girl. It references to this deep Baltimore house song yep. that I, you know, mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with. Right. And when I saw this image, I was just wondering about the interaction with a demon, because I know you have like demons are a part of that layered. I do have demons. Yes. Epic <laughs> mythology yeah, yeah, concept yeah. or whatever. And yeah. so I was just wondering, like, what is going on with the demon in the corner? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where they come from. They sneak up on you. That's the thing about demon. Well, the, for the original Japanese print of this is of a sumo wrestler mm -hmm. who is defiantly blowing smoke in a demon's face. Which, you know, if you smoke and you blow smoke in somebody's face, this is so disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, I, you know, I don't think, I know that it would be wonderful and um, a beautiful thing if I could disregard all my demons. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always happen like that though. Mm -hmm. um, but the, pic, the, 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 the print is just so strong because he is defiant. He's like not gonna let this demon do anything to him. Mm. And it, it, you know, for what it is, it's, it's a man and he's blowing smoke in the demon's face. Okay, I get that. But as a woman, that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. When you actually confront the thing that is holding you back, I mean, I've been immobilized by stuff, like recently, like mm -hmm. I just couldn't move on it. Because fear is, fear is, fear is, I'm serious. wow, yeah, it really mm -hmm. is. But I think as a, as a wielder of a paintbrush, mm -hmm. it almost, it empowers you a lot of ways to at least depict the thing that you wish you could do. Right. So right. I might still have these demons, but right here it's, it's defiance, like I'm not afraid of you. It doesn't matter that I'm big. And Ayn is actually, Ayn actually start, started out as a woman. Oh, Ayn is everything I'm not. Everything I'm not. So that he's got like long, that. luxurious black <clears throat> hair, which you can see that I don't, which doesn't mean that I don't want it. I don't either. And I can't help it, because <laughs> I was right. You know, you brought into that society where you're automatically like, oh, this looks awful. I need to have the long blonde weave. And that's, that's just the reality of it. And that's part of the demon, that's part of the demonized world that this particular character lives in. And is she part of the villain? Because I'm, um, the hoochie pooty. The hoochie pooty. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's in the same realm, right? Who, I'm? Right. Yeah, he actually is a he. I'm sorry, He's he. No, 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 it's fine. He starts out as a woman, and the reason that he becomes a demon has to do with a lot of what you see in a lot of Japanese um, tales about if you get too caught up in something, mm -hmm. if you obsess about something, if you lust for something, mm -hmm. you automatically become a demon. And I kind of flipped it because there's a, there's a demon in um, Japanese mythology called Yasha, uh, who kills men, lobs off their heads, eats them, mm. um, but somehow became a deity. I don't know how he got the promotion. Mm. But then mm. I, I flipped it so that Ayn actually starts out as a woman and because she's so obsessed with the things she's obsessed with, mm -hmm. she becomes this demon that I refer to as a, as a male figure because I have questions about pimps. Mm. This is my springboard for pimps. Mm -mm. Last musical reference. This is mm. um, the children's Sl story. Slick Rick, Yes. a children's story. So you reference to this ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh, just another case about, about the, the wrong, wrong path. path. Yeah. Right. So I know it's deep. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about this. So 
At the very top are two letters, the letters M and R, mm -hmm. which when I did it, I didn't remember. I had forgotten about Color Purple and Celie calling her husband Mr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I looked at two words. I looked at demise and desire. Mm -hmm. And desire being the cause of your demise. And I just kind of did common denominators. And the only word, the only two letters that were left were M and R. And I was like, well, there it is. Men are <laughs> the demise. Mm -hmm. I don't really mean that. <laughs> but for this particular part of the story, I'm, because he's a man, ends up being the demise of anime. Mm. Oh, and the hoochie pooties. And the hoochie pootie are up here, yeah. Uh, and that's hot with a blonde. And the hoochie pootie are, yeah, they have, they're all trying to inundate her with blonde weaves. Yeah. And the hoochie pootie are actually, um, you don't see their faces. Mm -mm. They have long hair. They have barcodes on their breasts and their behinds. Because uh -huh. they bought them. <laughs> they <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I'm just saying. All right. So obviously you transitioned from the whole AQ concept, blackface series. And sorry, this piece is actually in my collection. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no. Um, the, this is Tara Banks. Yes. And you completely transformed her. I did. You can't really see that well, but behind this... Um, the Mylar. The Mylar is a blonde weave. Right. It's the cover of the Essence magazine. Uh-huh. And uh, I was really, you know, and I have a lot of respect for Tyra because she actually said, I believe it was on her show, mm -hmm. she talks about how she has to have that because of her profession. Mm -hmm. Which, it's unfortunate. I mean, I, I respected her for that. Like, just that right there, that admission was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I never heard, you won't hear Beyonce say that. Yeah. I love Beyonce. And she's who not else is in your series? Admit. Mary J. I've got Keisha Beyonce. Cole. She's Beyonce. not going to admit that. Beyonce, exactly. Keisha Cole's not in it. I've got Mary J. Blige. Beyonce, I've been slowly working on. I don't know if I really want to do, I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. in New York. I don't know if, you know. <laughs> somebody could come around the corner. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I, I recognize that as an actual issue. I mean, it is an issue. Mm -hmm. And now in New York, I don't see too many women with natural hair. And I can't afford a weave. <laughs> no, I'm not even trying to be funny. Like, it's actually something that like, I wish I could do because it, it looks amazing. And it looks amazing to me because of what I've been told about my own grain of hair. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to do all this kind of stuff. I used to love Cher. You know, that was, <laughs> that was my thing. <laughs> All the time, <laughs> but we're told that this is ugly, so yeah, I have to. This is like counter what I really want, it's counter, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's an ongoing struggle. It's not easy, you know, mm -hmm. it's not something that, that I think is uh, it's not designed to be easy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that if you don't, if you don't come into this world as a black woman, you, you may never understand that, right? But I obsess about it, I obsess about hair all the time. You wouldn't think so, but this is, I mean, you know, this I can afford. Mm -hmm. I even stopped going to my barber because I was like, that's a lot of money. I'm just going to let it grow. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a, it, it bothers me. It really bothers me that I don't think that this is beautiful. Right, right. So that's what I wanted to do was take these starlets, these black starlets that have this hair, mm -hmm. or these weaves, and give them something that's more Afrocentric. Right. Because my theory is you're still gonna be beautiful regardless of how your hair looks. Mm -hmm. It's not about your hair. Right. Now I know that you have a couple of things, a couple of pots on the fire, so to speak. Um, one show at G Fine Art. Correct. Which opens that opens tomorrow. tomorrow. You gotta go to. Um, and you have a whole new series of works and I'm dying to hear the these, story behind these images. Right, we should probably jump around a little bit. Jump around? Yeah, so go, go, nope, the other way. Oh, the back, backwards? Yeah. Okay. One more, right here. Yeah. So this, I started this last year, so I actually had, had left some of the blackface to do the Cleveland show, mm -hmm. uh, which was specifically about getting the myth 
going. And when I finished that, and I actually moved to New York, which I did about a year ago, um, I did this piece. But I was still interested in the blackface. My last show at G Fine Art, which was like, I think, 07, mm -hmm. I started playing around with the, with the blackface. Actually, the, the woman when I spoke of that I photographed, and she had all that attitude. Mm -hmm. You can see that the blackface is no longer like kabuki or geisha makeup. It's right. not that obvious. So it becomes, right. I'm playing around with it being more organic because I started to wonder, I have all these DJ friends. They clearly have an appreciation for music. They're clearly a, a, a drawn to black music, black sounds, and they're respectful. So there has to be another platform for them because they're not black facing, they're not sagging and, and doing any of that. They have an appreciation and an affection for the music. So by 2007, I started to make it more organic. We wanted to see sorry, what it looked like if there was an infusion, like mm -hmm. an actual mashup, right? Right. So I, I did the Cleveland show, and then when I came back, uh, when I moved to New York, I, I, I got a commission, and, and they wanted, the people wanted um, blackface. Mm. Ish. They wanted it ish. Money. They wanted me to do whatever I wanted to do. So I started playing around with how the skin was incorporated. Mm -hmm. And I did want it to kind of look like when you couldn't tell what was becoming what. So that's, this is the first installation of that. Beautiful. Thanks. So the next, this, and, and, and I know that we're jumping around, but I have a. You want me to jump around to the, to ahead? Yeah, let's, let's, okay. There you go. You can stop here. Love it. So again, with the blackface becoming a little bit more organic or a lot more organic, these are two pieces that, uh, um, this is actually, a re this is still in my studio, which is why it looks mm. like that. Because mm. I had to put a tattoo on her body. But after that, it's done. And this belongs to a good friend of mine named um, Dr. David Hughes, who's here tonight. And this is actually says for Octavia on the side. Mm. Um, one of the stories she talked about right. is the end of the world and these aliens come down and they save Earth and they start <laughs> pairing people up. So she paired an Asian man with a black woman, mm. which I thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, but the blackface starts to do more organic things here. And then by the time you get here, it's like 3D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you want me to keep going? Yeah, go ahead. Don't <sighs> pass that one. Talk about it. Yeah, one more. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so I did a piece called Divine Selecta a while ago for that same show that I did with G Fine Art, mm -hmm. where the blackface was more organic. And uh, that was Divine Selecta one, which was my tribute to the DJs. Right. And it's an image of a young man who um, was depicted in a print by Yoshitoshi. He goes to check on his family. It's called Moon of the Filial Sun. So he goes to go check on his family to make sure that they're doing okay. And in the image, he's binding some wood. But when I did the blackface work, I would look at the print mm -hmm. and I'd see the print and then I would see it doing something else. Mm. So for example, a woman drinking sake and holding a crab, I actually saw her as holding a bottle of Cristal and drinking it. So those kinds of things, that's, that's kind of what happened. So when I looked at him and he was crouched on the ground over this bundle of wood, I said, he looks like he's DJ. So I tricked out the hands a little bit and I actually made him look like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's this big gold leaf swoosh because I really believe that DJs are connected to something completely different. They really are. And I'm not saying it because I'm a DJ, I mean, I believe that. Mm -hmm. Because it's all innate, it's like, okay, you can't even really let your ego get into it. You might want to drop that next record, but if it's not the time, you can't. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everybody's gone off the floor. You're talking about real DJs. I'm talking about real DJs. <laughs> So the Divine Selector was my tribute to DJ. So then here comes Divine Selector 2. This is after I've been in New York. And I've been walking around New York for a year. And I, I mean, you know, we don't have enough time. But I was really interested more in the hand position, which is more mudra-like. Mm -hmm. Which if you look at Indian paintings, anytime it's, there's some sort of hand figure, that's a mudra. So for me, for this particular angel, her mudra is what you would do when you're about to like, Spin. exactly, you're about to drop the record. Yeah. So you see her doing like that, mm -hmm. and then the divine part as opposed to having that gold leaf swoosh, and I'm sorry, I didn't bring the painting image, 
but as opposed to having that good leaf swoosh, I gave it more of a cloud, which kind of filters mm. right into her hair. Mm. They want me to show you with the audience. I'm being stingy here. They want me to share you with the audience. Oh, like, oh, questions. oh, oh, oh. But, okay. um, these are all, these all on are... display at G Fine Art. <laughs> Is that shameless? They're amazing. Please come. They it's are tomorrow. absolutely amazing. Tomorrow yeah. and you have something going on in New York. And Performa, yeah. So some of these Form earlier 11. images. Yeah, some of these early images you can actually. And you're going to be doing a performance on the 17th and the and 18th, 18th of exactly. November. So the, the image of or the character K, who's from this, the myth, mm -hmm. is actually who we're focusing on. And I've got Javier Ninja from the legendary House of Ninja, um, voguing. Mm. Um, he's going to be performing as K. And Benny Ninja is doing I'm. I have to get up to New York. Please that. come. On that Friday. Amazing. Um, but I'm going to open it up to the okay. audience for questions, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. And just remember that this is um, a webcast, so a live webcast, so you want to make sure you speak directly into the mic. I have a question. <laughs> Love it. Which is actually a perfect segue. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, being invited to participate in Performa as a painter. Can you hear what I'm asking? And uh, what the process has been like, the creative process of working with performers, and what role do you see yourself as? Are you the, the playwright and the director, or what is your role, and how is it different from painting? First of all, when I paint for a show, Annie could tell you, it's just me. I don't leave the studio. The phone is off. I don't talk to anybody. Partially because I'm kind of a jerk. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I am, because I'm focused on what I'm doing. So anything that distracts me from painting, is a problem. I treat it like that. My family doesn't call me. My aunt and my godmother are here. They don't call me. And that's not even like, I'm not even trying to be fun. I'm very serious. Like, I have to maintain whatever I have so that I can put it in the painting. So, that said, having to work at Performa, well, not having, but the opportunity to work for Performa, I can't be in my studio by myself. I have to interact. Um, there's a really funny cartoon that uh, is a Bugs Bunny cartoon. He happens to punch some baseball bullies. He decides he's going to take them on. So the announcer goes, first base, Bugs Bunny. Second base, Bugs Bunny. Shortstop, Bugs Bunny. Outfield, Bugs Bunny. Catching, Bugs Bunny. That's what I'm doing. Choreographing. I did the sound design. I did the costumes. I did the story. I did the music. The only thing I'm not doing is the actual dance. I actually told the dancers what I wanted, which is bold. Because I'm not a dancer, but I know what I want. Mm -hmm. And they, they comply. They were like, OK, we're here for you. But it's strange. I'm not supposed to be here. I still got stuff to do. <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, how can I complain about that? I can't. I refuse to complain about it because it doesn't make any sense. It's an opportunity. It's something that, you know, I went to Japan with this proposal. That was the proposal that I wrote out. I didn't think it was going to happen, ever. And then I met Rosalie Goldberg from Performa, and she said, I can make that happen. And I thought, you know, whatever. Like I did my mom with the, like the men, like whatever. And then she's doing it. Yeah, I'm blessed. What can I say, man? I'm, I, it's so bright, I can't look at it. I literally am looking down most of the time, just trying to get it done, because I can't. It's, mm. it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to know, do you, have you explored, and I think I saw some of it with the slides that we just kind of went through and didn't get to hear you speak about, yeah. the reciprocal nature of... Japanese culture and black culture because we see it, here, you know, especially in the 70s and you've got um, uh, karate films and that type of thing that I think that my generation definitely in the 80s appropriated this 
kung fu type attitude culture. I think they're going to do a remake of The Last Dragon starring Samuel L. Jackson. Have you thought about that? <laughs> and <laughs> have you thought about that and thought about exploring it in your work at all? Making kung fu flicks all the time. There's not a day that I don't think about. It. Is that what you meant? Or exploring it like our uh, African American our appropriation of, of it that culture. Yes, all the time. I think I'm that personified. I think that um, for me, the most wonderful bit of knowledge that I got, there's two things that I got. One, Bruce Lee and my mother have the same birthday. <laughs> so does Jimi Hendrix. The second one was knowing that Bruce Lee, when he opened up his first school, it was in Oakland in the hood, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was one of his first students and one of his closest friends. So it's right there. Bruce knew it. If you look at Return of the Dragon, not Enter the Dragon, Return of the Dragon, where he goes to Rome and whoops up on Chuck Norris. <laughs> Poach Chuck. But if you, go, if you look at that film, you have to watch that film very carefully, because when Bruce goes through the first round of, of butt whoopings, there's a black guy that comes in there with the little, with the little boxing style. And Bruce kind of clowns him. He kicks his butt, but then he clowns him. But then you see it again when Chuck comes at him and Chuck is actually kicking Bruce's butt. And Bruce takes a second to regroup and he's like, wait a minute, what was that dude doing? And then Bruce, I was like, Bruce, you're not slick. <laughs> but you might miss that if you don't know that's what he was about. And Bruce was about that merging. He's about that mashup. He says, I don't care what style of fighting you have, as long as it's effective, he'll incorporate anything. So because of Bruce, and I used to sleep with Bruce on my ceiling to protect me. I'm not even lying about that. That's real. Bruce, as a kid, I was like, you got to look out for me while I'm sleeping, kid. And he did, and it was, from, it was from Chinese Connection, and he had the nunchucks, and he was like that, but I always felt akin to that. There was a theater over here, down, further down, like on East Street, you could go there on Saturdays and watch kung fu movies all the time. And I think that there's something really empowering about being able to beat somebody up with your hands. There's no gun involved in that. And it's magical. It's so spiritual, right? He's got, these are, nunchucks, all those weapons are from like farmers. They did that so that they could still do kung fu because when the Qing Dynasty came in, Qing Dynasty said only the regal people can do kung fu. So everybody in the fields was like, well, what are we supposed to practice? So they slowed it down. <laughs> right? It's like if you, go to, if you look at Cuba, and you look at the Roomba, and you look at Santeria, that's how they were able to maintain, you know, that's how they were able to maintain connection with their own deities. You bring in Christianity, you got a lot of angels and archangels. Bet, Oya, Chango. You do what you can. So I kind of, I feel like, I am that personified, which is not to say that I don't believe that there needs to be more of that visually. Benny Ninja. I mean, Willie Ninja, let's take this, go there. We don't even have to go too far. Willie Ninja was all about that. He didn't even know from Kabuki. He watched a lot of kung fu movies. But when I looked at Willie Ninja do the duck walk and I see Bando Thomas Sabro do the same duck walk and they're all the way over here, I'm like, it's there, it's innate. We can't help it. You go to Hong Kong, you go to any dim sum place, I'm going to tell you what, they're going to have smothered chicken feet. Deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. It's already there. You just had to open your eyes to it. It's already there. You just wait for everybody else to get caught up, then we go. Mm. <laughs> I have answered all the questions. I know, I see. <laughs> No one has to ask anything. Uh-oh. This is a student. Maybe. Sweet. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question, and it, it might be kind of like rhetorical, I guess, um, and I'm not really expecting uh, like a concrete answer. Ouch. No, no not, okay. She doesn't well, expect then, okay, anything. Okay, let's go, okay. Okay, go let's see what you I'm got. I'm sorry, okay. I'm gonna leave you alone, I'm sorry. Go okay, ahead. so um, 
A lot of your work and a lot of what you've talked about tonight is addressing um, just the stereotypes that are like so deeply embedded in American culture and then kind of transported and appropriated and become embedded in you know other cultures across the world and with so many of the negative stereotypes that are just being like propelled and propagated like in these communities like you were talking about the blackface um, Japanese kids like what I guess how do you kind of uh, toe the line between respecting an art or a culture and then like being okay sorry backtrack oh, take it down. Um, so if you're not a member of that culture, so if you are an Asian individual or like a white girl who really likes hip hop, like, is <laughs> it, is it automatically? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, co you can be my plus one. Is that what you want? <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm going to okay. hold you to that. <laughs> Come on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Why so, don't you stop me before I start talking? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. Okay, so if you are like not inside, if you're not born into that culture, mm -hmm. how do you keep from being viewed as like condescending or mm -hmm. posing mm -hmm. or like faking your mm -hmm. way through it? Like, and I understand that like respect. Just, I mean, there's so much right. of like youth culture that seems to be lacking respect. Like they don't, you see people who don't understand what it is that they're copying or anything like that. But so that's just something that I'm always kind of like on edge about, or I kind of feel like. Tentative to it. Well, yeah, I don't know. Like it just seems like how, okay. And so then on another note, like how is it okay for members of the same race in the same culture to use like negative stereotypes with one another. Oh, you want to use the N word? I no. see where you go. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. I'm You're just playing with you. Here. Come on, come on. I'm just playing with you. Okay. This is like gonna be on the internet. So. Oh, like. No, is it? Sorry. <laughs> I'm so. You know what? I have to. Okay. Do this, do this. Let me give you a disclaimer. A disclaimer is, I, I, in my other, I actually wanted to be a comedian also, so okay. please don't listen to me. If you laugh, you will encourage me. And I'm sure my mother is looking at me right now, wishing she could smack me upside the head. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. I couldn't, I just That's wanted okay. to go in though. To get in there right quick. Are you, is that it? That's the question? I mean, I think, I, I think I've said enough. <laughs> Huh? It's a rhetorical question, remember? Uh, yeah, that was a rhetorical question. Like I need to get you a drink. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank well, you. Know, you. It's, I, I'll tell you that. This is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> say. I'm gonna say this to you. And I don't know, huh? I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I put you through it too. You're sweet, though. I appreciate that. I think that. Um, I think that the key for for anybody is just be clear about what's in your heart. I mean, I know that sounds a little new agey and it's not very art fancy or anything like, you know, art speak in that. This is me just telling you, if you like hip hop, just like hip hop. And my theory was when I went to Japan, you could, if you look like Beck, I mean like cardigan sweater and, and you like hip hop, and most of my friends that aren't black don't look like most of the people that I depict. But they know more about hip hop than I do. There's people sitting close to you that know more about hip hop than I do, right now, currently. And it doesn't have anything to do about how they dress or how they talk. It's about what's in their heart, and that's what's always gonna shine through. I'm committed to my Japanese black mashup. I'm committed to it, I haven't left. I've been doing this since 2000. Mm -hmm. I live for it. I bring other stuff in because I, I live for mashups. And I really live for people getting along. And I know that sounds cheesy, but that's my naive way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of vernacular, you know, you could try it. 
I'm not going to tell you not to say stuff, but just know that when you say certain things that there's repercussions for that. You might get real comfortable one night with some people. <laughs> and it, you know what I mean? I mean, it happens. It happens. I've seen, I've seen things on the internet. <laughs> It happens, but I think I think with that particular, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna just gonna zone in on that particular word. I think that that word is very charged, but there's other words that have been um, that have been donned on other ethnicities that are just as charged. And I think that if you're as empathetic to it as I think that you are, then you won't make that mistake. That's not a problem. Just listen to the music, get from it what you think you're supposed to get from it. Allow yourself to get other things from it. Continue to be who you are and just and just keep moving because I mean music is accessible. It's that's why it's here My theory is that that you know that whole like Amazon cloud thing Right you've heard about that. I had I was like I wonder if that's what you get to listen to when you de when after you die It's a cloud So you die and every so I'm like let me put all the music that I want to listen to for eternity in that <laughs> You know, but music is, is powerful and hip hop is really powerful. So don't feel ashamed that you like it. And don't feel, don't feel any way about liking it, honestly. Yes. Well, just kind of on another note. Mm -hmm. Come, come, do it, do it. Like, well, I don't know. As you, like, young girl, not yeah, young no, girl. Okay. Well, I mean, both of us, young, young ladies. Um, so is there, like, it almost seems a little bit hypocritical sometimes, uh, not necessarily for me specifically, but just for people. Like, can you, like, sing the lyrics of the song that is putting you down as a gender Right. Like, and, right. you know, like, how Chris do you... Chris Rock has a whole routine about that. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh... But, like, how do you marry those two things? Because it's not going to stop if you keep listening to it. And even, like, I mean, I completely appreciate, and I, I think I understand a lot of what your art kind of addresses mm -hmm. in that regard. Right. Um, and there's, like, you have a lot of, like, subtle kind of, like... I don't know, mockery almost, and like sarcasm, right. which certainly puts a different twist on it. Right. Um, but I don't know, like, because you said you have like a an affinity towards like protecting young young girls. Young girls. All right, I'll tell you the story. So I was listening to the dream. Remember, I mentioned the guy, the dream. Now I, I listen to the dream. I'm grown though. Grown. And I'm listening to this guy, and he reminds me of Prince. I mean, there's a, he's, he's, I feel it's, it's unfortunate because I think he's more, I think he's a better musician than he's allowed to be or he chooses to be. I don't know if the record companies make these artists dumb stuff down or if they opt to dumb it down. But you know, it's about units, right? They have to sell. So I'm listening to, to, to Dream in the car with my goddaughter, who at the time was 16. He's on the radio and I'm driving. She's singing the song and I was like, oh no, no, no. No, not while I'm here. Like, I, I know she listens to stuff, but I actually tried to engage her in a conversation about what she was listening to. So, for example, when I was 17, I don't know if you, do you listen to Prince at all? You know this song called Erotic City? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know that song? All right. So the song came out. I was actually on my way to a party. My mother was taking me to a party. Don't clown me. My mother was strict. And she was taking me to a party, and that song came on. Now, you know the lyrics. Erotic city, can't you see? Mm, so pretty you. All right. You don't know my mom, but there are people here who know my mom. So we're in the car, and Prince is laying his rap down, and he starts to say some really nasty stuff. And my mother said, no, indeed. Pluck up. <laughs> I was, it was awful. I was just, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Meanwhile, I had the record with me. So I was like, but I bought the record. What are you? I didn't say anything. So then fast forward it to like with my goddaughter, the song is on. I'm going to turn it off because she doesn't need to hear, but I need, I want to know where her head's at. Like, what does that make you think when he's saying that? That was important to me. So I needed to know what she thought about it. And I needed her to understand that, you know, that's not really what you want men to say about you, right? 
She's like, I guess. Well, then it took off into this whole other thing. I turned the music down. I started talking to her. I got my wish <laughs> twice. And then I put on something else. It happened to be Led Zeppelin. She was, it was Stairway to Heaven. She was like, oh, this is so boring. But then that breakdown comes at the end. She's like, oh, this is kind of nice. I'm like, I got you. But I mean, I, as, an, as an adult hanging out with children, I understand that that's what you're listening to. But if you're gonna listen to that with me, I need to understand, and I make it a point to try to understand what they think about the song, how it makes them feel. Because I know what they're talking about. I know exactly what he means by that. But I'm grown. You aren't grown yet. You still have a lot of living to do, so I don't need her going into the world thinking that R. Kelly urinating on girls is the way to be. I'm not even trying to be funny. I need her to know that that's not right. I need her to know that. I need her to know that at 16, it's not okay that some grown man, and this happened, driving a trash truck is trying to holler at you. That's not okay. I made a big scene. I told him, I was like, I'm gonna have you fired. I said a whole bunch of other stuff too. But I can't say that here. I laid him out because she, this is my child. That's my responsibility. And I feel like that, I would do that for you. I would do that for any young girl. I'm very serious about that. So, and I would do it for any young boy. I'm very serious about that. But that's, my, that's what I feel like my responsibility is. You can listen to that on your own time. But when you're with me, you have to explain to me why you like that song and what that song makes you feel. And then we have to talk it out. And then I have to undo everything that the dream has done. So that she knows that this is a cute song, but this is not, this is not the end. This is not how she should be treated. Ayon, I think we have one. So, oh, is it one or two? Let's do oh. two, three. Three, wow. Let's do all three of these. Yeah. No, I'm just, you know. <laughs> My question, is it on? That's the mic is not on. Okay. Can you hear me? No. I can, but the mic's not on. Can you, you hear me now? Ah. Yes. My question is, what has been the response to your work in Japan in terms of the major art galleries, museums, right. reviews, and the major art journals? Hmm. Well, let's start from the end of your question on. None of the big people in Japan have said anything to me. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, the only time that I've ever been in Japan and shown work, it was the blackface work. I got two reactions. When people liked it, they told me they liked it. I believed that they liked it. <laughs> because then I would show it to people who didn't say anything. And I presumed they didn't like it, and I didn't press it. Because I was visiting. And I figured that that's a culture that is very much about what's in between the lines. Right? I'm reminding them that their youth wanted to be black. I can't expect them to like that. It would be awesome, but that's not real. So when they didn't answer, and it was mostly the older Japanese, the younger kids were actually like, oh, sugoi, kawaii, nah. They really liked it. But the older people were like, they'd look at it, and didn't say anything, and I was like, right. Because I'm reminding you that there were a whole group of younger yous that wanted to look like me, and you still don't like me, so we're cool. Now, my hope, my, my hope really is that the myth might actually have some resonance over there. I was already over at Doshisha University in Kyoto a few years back before I'd actually started solidifying the myth. But I was talking about it, and I talked about its ties to Kabuki. And they, oh, they like that. A lot of, them don't go, a lot of the young people don't go to Kabuki, so in my dream world, my production, because it's a mashup of hip hop and, and kabuki, will actually generate more interest in kabuki. I don't know why I think that. I'm putting my cape on, like I'm saving something. But I really, I really hope that, because kabuki, is, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's one of the most phenomenal art forms that I've ever seen in my life. Same with no theater. And a lot of the young Japanese people don't check for it. They're more interested in the hip hop. So you know, spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. We'll see what happens. Hi. Hi. Uh, bringing you back to uh, 30 Americans a little bit. Of course. Um, 
Are a couple questions, and you can answer any of them or all of them. Uh, are there any uh, of your elders uh, in 30 Americans, artists that you sort of look up to and that you really respect? And then the other question is sort of a selfish collector question. Uh, who are you looking at in New York? Who, who are some of the artists that you're thinking are like, wow, you know, that, that person is just uh, is really hot? Mm -hmm. I adore Wenge Shimutu. Wenge Shimutu. I adore her as a person and, 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 and her artistry. I think she's, she's one of the most regal people I think I've ever met in my entire life, and I have so much respect for her. I don't see her often, but, uh, but when I do, I feel very calm, you know. Um, in terms of my elders, Jean-Michel, end of story. That's, that's a man that um, I, uh, I get really sad about him. I get really sad about him. And I think like Hen more than Hendrix, because I used to get really sad about Hendrix, but I get really sad about Jean-Michel, um, whose birthday is the day before mine. Um, because I feel like he wasn't really, I mean, yeah, he made a lot of money, but he really wasn't given a fair shot as a black male artist. I think it was, that was a rough time. And he paved the way. And there's no reason for me without him. And of all the older people that are in that show, he's the one. And it's not even about the fact that he made so much money. But we're talking about the 1980s. They were still burning crosses in College Park. Dig it? So for Jean-Michel to be able to express himself so freely like that during the 80s, that's, that's my man, all day, yeah. <laughs> that's my man. I saw one more, but that's, it doesn't have to be, okay. And I'm sorry, this will have to be our last question of the evening. We wanna make sure there's enough time to view the 30 Americans show. Please go see this, it's amazing yeah, if you haven't seen it. Definitely. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. <laughs> thanks for being here. I, oh, it's such it's a pleasure to finally get to hear you speak oh, about your work. Thank you. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a paper um, called Grounded Figures, Floating Worlds. It was a, a paper of, that surveyed your work in Kahende Wiley's um, segment on World Stage China. And it talked about uh, the, the interchange between cultures, black culture, black artists here sort of, um, and that cultural exchange coming back from Asia over to the US and specifically in contemporary art. And I did a lot of research on um, black popular culture and its transportation to different parts of Asia. And um, one thing that particularly struck me about your work is that there's a subversive thread um, of there, there's this dialogue going on about hair as a, as a signifier of blackness and, and a signifier of authenticity. And I find it interesting that whenever there's a, there's a culture, um, specifically black culture, um, you can sort of be a part of it. You can be an observer, you can be um, non-participatory. And I look at this piece, it has to last, and it's interesting that like the, the one thing that pops up to me is I think about women who uh, just get their hair done and they sleep like this. Go ahead, keep talking. <laughs> I'm gonna let you answer your own question, go ahead. Because <laughs> you're already answering your own question, yeah, go ahead. But then I find that like, although I get, I look at this and mm -hmm. I've never worn my hair like this, but I know that there's this existence <laughs> of like gel and weave and like lace front wigs and, and a lot of this mm -hmm. is appropriated in other cultures as a, as a way to sort of, like particularly Okinawans, Okinawan women who, there's a, a base in Okinawa that um, a lot of black men in the military are there and, and women appropriate um, black female signifiers um, like <laughs> these hairstyles to attract those men. And so like black, black culture is uh, like purposed in different ways, but right. I find it interesting that there are a lot of other artists that are 
utilizing hair, but not, not, it's not at the forefront of their statements, but you, like Ellen Gallagher, McAleen Thomas, you, like it's, it's and there's scholarship about, a limited amount of scholarship about what's going on with hair. Okay. But then I'm thinking more so about, you know, survey a, a couple hundred years ago in the 19th, late 19th century, the, the presence of the absence of hair for slave figures was denoted by a handkerchief. And that handkerchief sort of represented that person's slave status. Okay. So it's interesting to me that like there's, there's so much signage when it comes to hair, but it's not necessarily delved in that deeply, I don't, I don't think, in, in terms of like, you talked about it briefly, your obsession with hair, but I would like to hear you talk a bit more about how represent, representing hair as a signifier um, plays out in your work, just a, a little bit more complex, in a, comple in a more complex way than it, I think Oh, you want me to get more complex? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. Well, this particular piece is after a Yoshitoshi print of a geisha who is sleeping like that. I saw photographs of geisha women all on this hair, all on that there, trying to keep their heads above because that's weave, you know, and that's got to last. So my platform tends to be one of commonalities. And my theory is that, you know, in my naive way, if you see me do something that you do, then we get closer together. That doesn't always work, though. I was in Korea. I saw this woman <laughs> sweeping out in front of her store, cracking gum, just <laughs> <laughs> I looked, I was like, are you kidding me right now with that? It's natural, though. People don't even read. She didn't even, I mean, she, she didn't know I was looking at her. She didn't know what I saw. She was just, that was her. But I thought, oh, see, we're the same. You try to deny it, but we're the same. In terms of hair, almost every woman in here got long hair. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. There's nothing wrong with long hair. There's nothing wrong. I was getting ready to say there's nothing wrong with straightening it, but I do think that there's something wrong with it. But that doesn't mean that I look down on women who have straight hair. I understand the source. So for me, because I understand the source, I feel like that allows me to just kind of say, well, whatever. I'm not going to judge, but I do a little bit. <laughs> because I know the source. It's a conundrum. I can't get out of it. The only reason that we straighten our hair is because why? You don't have to answer that. You know what the reason is. And I have an issue with that. I take big issue with that because you told me that I'm ugly. And I still feel that. My goddaughter feels that. All these young kids running around here feel that. Look at their hair. So how am I not going to be affected by that? It's still here. It's still here. So I take offense to it. I don't care how people wear their hair. But I take offense to the fact that there's a reason that there's a lie and whatever, the, whatever else, I almost cursed, that whatever else is up in there. I take offense to that. I used to have dreadlocks. I, now, you got to know this about me. I loved my grandmother. She could do no wrong in my eyes until the day she criticized my dreadlocks. I didn't go down there for two years. She was like, I don't like your hair like that. Can't you just, like, you, you? I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not straightening my hair. And this was, this was huge for me. I didn't want to do it. But here's the woman that I love criticizing me because I have my hair natural. There's something wrong with that. There's something really wrong with that. You know? And it's still here. If it, was, if it had disappeared like the jerry curl, I wouldn't be caring about this. <laughs> but it's still here. So I take issue with it because I understand the source. It's the, it's the source that I take issue with. You have the right to do whatever you want to do with your hair. 
And I depict it in my work because what you paint about is the thing that you either fear or hate or love, right? So it won't go away. I really try not to paint hair, I try. I can't help it though. I love how it looks. This chick's hair is behind the bedpost. Do you see that? Do you see this behind the bedpost and then comes back out? So she doesn't mess it up? It's behind the bedpost. She doesn't, see, I'm serious, I'm serious. And I think I got that from Ace Bigelow. When he was dating the narcoleptic girl and she <laughs> almost fell into the soup. I thought, oh man, that's hilarious. But there, I mean, there, it's all you do to look beautiful, right? We do all kinds of stuff. And it's not as simple as that because we're talking about black women's hair. So I'm a black woman and I defend black women and women that feel like they have to get weaves and get their hair straightened because of how they look because men don't pay attention to them if they have straight hair. Welcome to my world. I can't, don't do checks for me. And that's real, I'm painting about my life. That's real, I can't, I'm not making that up. How could I make that up? That's why if you look at the, if you go online to perform and you start looking at some of the images from my performance, my main character has tentacles. She can DJ with her tentacles, which is amazing. But she doesn't realize that she's amazing because I, who's got this straight hair, has told her she's not. That's all too common. Every time I look at Beyonce, who I love, I don't see me. I've never seen me. I grew up watching Tina Turner and Diana Ross. That's neither one of them are me. I love both of them, but they're not me. Diana's stuff is down here. <laughs> so is Shaka Khan, I love her, but that's not, that's not me. Cicely Tyson was me, but what's she play? All right. 